thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. I thank you for this opportunity to contribute to this debate on the Miscellaneous Amendments Bill 2020. Based on our limited speaking time for this period, I wish or I intend to very quickly delve into a number of clauses, not all 17 that are listed today. Madam, Mr. Vice President, allow me to begin with Clause 5, which amends the Oaths Act. And this amendment removes the, the general manner in which an oath is administered. Every member here would have taken an oath when we became a senator. Councillors, members of parliament take oaths. Mr. Vice President, Trinidad and Tobago is a multi-religious society. We have, for many years, had persons who are Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Baha'i, and other religious faiths serve this country and take oaths. When the traditional oath is recognized as um, holding the New Testament, or in the case of a Jew, the Old Testament, and using the term, I swear by Almighty God. This term is now to be deleted and substituted with, I solemnly swear. Um, as a result of this amendment, the act is, um, the act of uplifting your right hand is also repealed. As a person with a multicultural and multi-religious background myself, I have a deep appreciation for this measure finally taking place. What I do wish to bring to the attention of the Senate is that we still have one exception that is not captured here. Some Christians even today do not take an oath, do not swear. Um, there is, uh, in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 34, in the New Te um, Testament, where um, there's a sermon on the mount, and there was a discussion on oaths. oaths. Um, <clears throat> but I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. So some Christians interpret this verse literally to mean that all oaths are prohibited even though in other parts of the Bible, oaths are looked upon more favorably. These persons today take an affirmation, which is a solemn declaration, and it is considered legally binding even now. It satisfies the requirement for an oath um, for those who do not believe in taking oaths. I want to ask, Madam, Mr. Vice President, as we are taking this bold and forward step to this amendment, for us, for it to be included, those persons whose belief does not allow them to swear, but would allow them to take an affirmation, even though I know it is already practiced um, in that people can take an oath um, saying, I solemnly affirm, as opposed to saying, I solemnly swear, which is what is recommended here. We could simply put an addition. So where um, the, the amendment says, insert, substitute the word I, you call your name and say solemnly swear, you can say I solemnly affirm. And that is something I want, would like to see um, be included. Um, Mr. Vice President, very quickly I move to uh, Clause 6, which seeks to amend the limitation of certain actions act by inserting a new section that provides for the exclusion of the period March 27, 2020 to April 20, 2020. This, I presume, of course, is inclusive. And this, we know, is based on the corona pandemic lockdown period, and many businesses and government offices would have been closed and not functioning, and therefore, the government seeking to have this period in, 
excluded from the computation of any limitation period under this act empowers the attorney general to, um, to by order, prescribe a longer period. I just want to bring to the attention of the parliament that this may have been drafted at a time when Trinidad and Tobago, when the prime minister would have declared that lockdown period for going up to the 20th of April. That period has since been extended to April 30th, and then subsequently, um, we are told that on May 10th, we are expecting an announcement. So I, I think we can take the opportunity now to change it from April 20th to May 10th to encompass the entire period for which Trinidad and Tobago has been under this lockdown so as not to disadvantage anyone and to be very clear. Although I do recognize that the Attorney General has the power to extend this period, there is no harm in us putting the, the correct date and you know, updating it from the time it was drafted. Mr. Vice President, that brings me to my submissions on clause seven, which amends the Summary Offenses Act and increases the penalties relating to cruelty to animals. Mr. Vice President, the, given the recent rise in reports of animal abuse and cruelty in Trinidad and Tobago, we saw social media videos where uh, some misguided young people hung a dog by its neck with a piece of rope on a tree. We saw another where a dog was cut in half. And this is coming to the attention of the nation based on social media. But certainly, those things may not be um, unusual. Well, they are unusual. They are very unusual and natural. But um, these things may have happened before. But because we did not have social media available, we were not exposed to it. And the penalties at present are very archaic. So these increases are more than necessary and long overdue. And uh, the Minister of Agriculture mentioned some of the organizations who have been contributing to um, and advocating for increased penalties for cruelty to animals. And I have been in touch with a number of them as well. So I do share his sentiment when he said that um, these measures are long overdue. What I also got a bit excited about when I heard the Minister of um, Agriculture speaking is that the present amendment deals with cruelty to animals, working animals unfit for work, bull baiting and cock fighting and similar offenses. But it does not deal with cruelty to animals for food. How are chickens reared? What conditions are they kept under before they reach our plate? Cows for beef and other large commercial meat rearing enterprises. Um, so while the, the penalty for um, is increased for working an unfit animal. Working an animal in agriculture is different to rearing an animal for food. A, a lot of consciousness is abound globally about the health and well-being of animals that are being reared for food. And of course, because we eat whatever goes into those animals, we also have to be concerned about what comes to our plate. I just want to um, to share with, the, with this Senate that there is the Animal Welfare Act of, um, of 2006 in the UK uh, to combat animal abuse, which came in force in 2007. And the aim was to update the Protection of Animals Act, which was enacted in 1911. So they too had many archaic laws with regards to animal cruelty. And it basically makes any individual responsible for an animal to perform a duty of care by meeting its basic needs. And this good, these good practice guidelines um, include a suitable diet, ensuring that the animal exhibits normal behavior patterns, a suitable environment, 
housing with or without other animals, protection from suffering, disease, and injury. And I read this, I'm, I'm sharing this for you to understand how it would tie back in to animals that are being reared for food in Trinidad and Tobago. So while the new act builds on the, um, the Animal Protection Act in the UK, um, and it with um, the other offenses in that act in the UK, in addition to the law concerning animal fights, which is including, included today in our amendment, it also deals with the selling, exchanging, or giving a pet as a prize to a child. Because we know circumstances can take place where, you know, neglect and mistreatment, not intended, but you know, as well as the mutilation of animals, unless it is as a good medical cause. For example, if a surgery has to be performed on animals. So the serious crimes in the UK can get a fine up to 20,000 pounds or 51 weeks of imprisonment. So that's about a year of imprisonment and you might get Christmas off. And those convicted in the UK can be permitted, prohibited from owning or dealing with animals in the future. So that is something I think we should consider. The Minister of Agriculture did refer to another piece of legislation, which he said is before a joint select committee. Um, but as I think it's important for us to, I think we can include in this uh, section 80, where we are dealing with um, animals unfit, um, a penalty for working on animal unfit for work. We can include another section to deal with the well-being or the um, or the conditions that animals for food are kept. Um, uh, and and I, I don't want to go any more any further into that. And I know we could discuss it at the committee stage. Mr. Vice President, one other recommendation I would have was mentioned by Senator Dr. Um, Diaz. Dialsing, Varma Dialsing, Senator Varma Dialsing, who is a psycho psychologist and psychiatrist, and it has to do with the counseling of children and adults who are found to be offending this act. Violence against animals is, is often, as he indicated, an indication of a psychological disorder and could lead to violence against persons. Many times you look at documentaries of serial killers, for example, or persons with a violent history, criminal history. The people who knew them as children speak about them harming animals, burning cats, cutting off the tails of dogs, and this type of behavior, which is maybe a result of trauma or their own psychological um, issues being acted out. So I think it's important for us to have um, rehabilitation or um, involved in the sentencing aspect. Our Trinidad and Tobago prison service motto is to hold and treat. And I always say we hold them, but I don't know how much we treat in them. It's more like mistreating sometimes when you think of human, the human rights aspect. But I think in this regard, rehabilitation, even if it means community service, Many times magistrates in Trinidad and Tobago sentence persons to community service at the dog pound at the various regional corporations and city corporations. So something like that that is related to the well-being of animals might be a suitable place to have community service performed. Um, but I think that that rehabilitation part is very um, to me is very critical for the well-being of, of our society where violence and we are trying to reduce violence in our society and it doesn't only start when a murder is committed. It starts, it could start with the animal neglect, abandonment and mistreatment of animals. I don't like this new time, you know. <laughs> Mr. Vice President, I move quickly to clause 10 which amends the Children's Act, and it requires a constable, where a constable reasonably, 
reasonably believes that a child is in possession of or using a dangerous drug or similar substance, he shall warn the child, obtain the relevant contact information, and notify the children's authority of the incident. Uh, at present, it was mentioned that at present, a constable can only issue a warning where he suspects a child is using tobacco products or alcohol. And I can tell you, as a mother um, of a preteen boy, I have had to acquaint myself with information on the dynamism of drugs in this new age. Drugs and, and, and drug abuse and chemicals that are introduced to our children through very innocent seeming things. I also, Mr. Vice President, um, want to mention the important, um, importance of counseling in this aspect. I know that the Children's Court, the Children's and Family Division of the Court has provisions for these things, and I think it is high time that drugs, the definition in this regard, be expanded and not just be limited to tobacco products and alcohol. There are drugs in candies, in food, and so on, and we must protect our children and give the authorities the ability to protect our children. Mr. Vice President, uh, in Clause 19, where the, um, it is a provision to, uh, for the composition of the Board of Directors of the Caribbean Industrial Research Institute Act, um, the board it is, it's listed here, the board shall comprise of a chairman who shall be a government representative, um, the uh, president appointed by the trade minister, and so on. If you would forgive me, I would not read all the provisions there. I just want to say that under the United Nations stipulations, Whenever the Caribbean Industrial Research Institute has a grant or, um, or getting, is getting any assistance from the UNDP, it is, it is one of their stipulations that a UNDP representative shall have membership of the board. And that is not present, so... Um, I think we could insert that UNDP representative where necessary. Um, so that, that phrase would cover it. Mr. Vice President, I also want to, in conclusion, to say that this bill seeks to amend 17 or 18 pieces of um, acts of parliament, which are in the main not connected to each other at all. And the majority of them are not concerned at all with the present pandemic. I don't know if the government regards these as urgent. I just want to caution that it does to some extent fly in the face of the safeguards and the warnings from the government, from the World Health Organization, um, from other countries with regards to um, parliamentary scrutiny given the present circumstances. So, with all, the, um, with all the rules regarding parliaments worldwide, I want to refer to an article entitled, Coronavirus Changes to Practice and Procedure in the UK and Other Parliaments. We follow the United Kingdom's parliamentary model. It is outlined how virtual proceedings among other social distancing measures are impacting parliaments worldwide at this time. In the Danish parliament, for example, we have encouraged the ministers to only demand consultations on the most pressing political matters, for example, in connection with the urgent bills currently being debated. We have likewise requested that only essential committee meetings be held and that a number of the number of participants be restricted. Mr. Vice President, the opposition has proven by our presence and support and participation in the debates during this time that we are willing to engage and continue in our duties. But we as leaders must send the right message to Trinidad and Tobago about what is essential in this time if we are to, set, if we are to expect the citizens 
to, um, to follow the guidelines that are being given by the government with regards to this lockdown period. Mr. Vice President, I thank you for the opportunity to contribute. Senator Obika. As I rise to contribute to this bill, I, I too must join in my colleague, Senator Amin, and lament the fact that we have so many clauses that are not related to each other in any shape or form, and yet we are required to only spend 20 minutes. So I want to register in protest what I see but nothing else than a subversion of the spirit of debate in Parliament. Now, I want to start by focusing on Clause 8. And I listened to the, which, which speaks to Animal Cruelty, the Summary Offenses Act, and I listened to the, the Minister of Agriculture uh, talking about uh, their working animals and so on. I'm not sure how that relates to increasing the, the, the fines and the penalties and, and increasing jail time. And I'm not sure if one year in prison or even six months in prison, as opposed to a maximum of two months in prison, would assist in meeting the objects of the legislation. Because what, what would be the objects of this legislation? The object should be to ensure that we have more humane treatment of animals in our society, that we become a better society all around, more conscious society of the impact of our actions. And I'm not sure if 12 months in prison with hardened criminals would meet the objects of reforming a human being's mindset to a dog, a parrot, or what have you, and allow them, upon release from prison, to treat animals in any better way. I'm not sure that this even makes any sense whatsoever. In the words of the Attorney General, this clause is a nonsense, Mr. Vice President. It, it, it doesn't fix, in fact, it may, it, it may exacerbate the problem of animal cruelty for those persons who are so incarcerated. It confuses me as to why we would see it fit to charge persons up to $100,000 and jail term for up to 12 months when what really may be required is teaching them how to love animals, putting them in a, in a scenario where they can reorient their thinking towards better treatment of animals. I must, I must confess, I grew up in a household where having a pet dog was important and it made you develop such a deep appreciation for the sensitivity and the sensibilities of dogs and how it can calm you and help you even as a child. I cannot believe that if someone were to hurt an animal, you would put them in a position where they have to fight for their survival as we know it. At least those documentaries have, discovered, as have, have disclosed it behind prison walls and then for them to come out a better individual. I'm not sure I agree with that clause entirely at all. We should have looked at alternative dispute resolution, other, other mechanisms which, persons, which can help persons uh, improve. Now, we look to clause 10. And clause 10 speaks to the impact on children regarding, the, regarding dangerous drugs or, or similar substances. And there's a question I had regarding this. Um, had this debate not been such where it's like a callaloo, you take 18 unrelated clauses, except the ones that deal with Central Bank and FIU, and you collapse them into a small debate, we cannot do justice, Mr. Vice President, to this clause. 
This clause should have been the beneficiary of fulsome debate, whereby we can even look at the, the, the recent changes we made that impacted marijuana as it is prosecuted in this country, and how, how have the police service been able to, to manage the, the, the fact that now marijuana must be allowed to be grown in households, where children are to also be found. How has that impacted on the dynamic of those societal, those households in our country? And children. But you just drop this thing here, and we are to say, okay, let's, let's just approve that. You know? How has the four plans per household affected children? Where four plans per adult, where the police service is now saying it's four plans per household. All these issues, we should have been able to reflect on them to determine if we agree with the, the interpretation of the law of the police service, if we agree with the views expressed or solicited views from the Children's Authority, solicited views from members of the public who have our children's interests at heart. I think it is wasteful for parliamentary time to put this clause here in the middle of so many other clauses. And it's very disappointing. The Plan Protection Act, Clause 12, Mr. Vice President. The Minister of Agriculture dedicated much of his contribution to the impact of, of the treatment of certain produce certain manufactured goods regarding this, the, the, the conditionalities under this act and the ability for them to be allowed into our country via ports of entry. But I think at a time like this, Mr. Vice President, as someone who is involved in matters pertaining to the food chain, the food value chain yourself, you would appreciate that something like this, given a time where world value chains and supply chains in agribusiness have collapsed for the main part, this would have given us an opportunity to take a critical look at our regime in Trinidad and Tobago and the approaches that we take regarding relations with countries that we import from as to how we can really improve our agribusiness sector via the inputs that we import and via the countries that we seek relations with. The country would have been better for such a debate, especially given the focus on food security, not from the Minister of Agriculture. I, mean, I, mean, I lament because the Minister of Agriculture is on record as saying that food security is not not something that, that is of priority to be, to be addressed. Um, it's, it, it, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sad to say, it's sad to say that the contribution of the military culture is, is like a plaster for a soul. But you have deeper questions to be answered regarding the value chains, which he merely alluded to in his contribution, that could have been addressed by legislation regarding the, 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 the focus on agriculture. In fact, the Prime Minister would have, would have joined me in lamentation because the Honorable Prime Minister himself went to Ghana looking to strengthen our agricultural production via, via yams in Ghana. And I myself can attest to the importance of agricultural business because many businesses that I deal with are involved in the value chain. And I'm, 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 I'm disappointed that all we get is a mere clause in a, in a lengthy bill. I want to turn to clause, seven, clause 14, which treats with the, the amendments to the Income Tax Act. And I want to say that there is no month, Mr. Vice President, there is no month in the history of this parliament that I have been involved in from September 2017 to date that I have had to see the government try to surreptitiously sneak into legislation changes to the Income Tax Act. 
that would water down the secrecy provisions that are available to taxpayers in this country. And let's be clear, tax secrecy is different from tax transparency. So we are not saying we want taxpayer information to be hidden when, when crimes are, are, are taking place, financial crimes, financing of terrorism and so on. We are not saying that at all. But there must be a transparent approach. Tax secrecy versus tax transparency. There must be a transparent approach whenever you are trying to access, manipulate, and utilize taxpayer private and confidential information. There was a meeting that we had with the, and it, it, because there's a, there's a specific change to this, to this law, this act of parliament, where prior, it would have mentioned an officer attached to the division responsible for financial investigation. A superintendent attached to that division. Now, what, what, what we are hearing now, it's, it's a superintendent above, not attached to the division responsible for financial investigation. Now, so that's just a question I, I, want to, I want to raise. What is the reason specifically for that specific nuance in this amendment based on what was already there before? Because Mr. Vice President, many times there were many bills brought with no explanation, no proper explanation that could have been defended in debate for the rationale for the watering down of the secrecy provision in, in the Income Tax Act under Section 4. And as a result of that, as a result of this government's failure to provide such a cogent explanation, those amendments were all removed. So the question is, why, why now? When you move on to Clause 15 with the Central Bank Act, Mr. Vice President, there are certain questions that we have to ask. Because you have similar changes being made to the Income Tax Act regarding secrecy. And also, you are removing the burden of prosecution. You are removing the, the, the stick that keeps the, the guarders of our financial information in line. The guards, my, my apologies. The guards of my, our financial information in line. So they are removing that stick. The question that, that arises from this cause is what would be the effect? What would be the consequences? Whether the confidence of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, whether the confidence in our financial services sector. Bearing in mind that the financial services sector is one of the largest contributors to our economy by virtue of foreign relations. It is one of the largest growing sectors in our economy in terms of the growth of our foreign operations. First Citizens Bank has operations in at least 10 other territories. Republic Bank has operations in at least 10 other territories. We have to be very careful because when you conduct operations in other territories, the, the, reach, the reach or the overreach of your central bank, or if in this case it's not of the central bank, of the executive of your country, because that's what the police represents. The police represents the ability of the executive to bypass proper institutional protections, to bypass standard operating procedures, and to interfere in the systems that function in a society. Nothing is wrong with the police. But it is 
if the police are being used or has the, if there is the potential for the police service to be used in such a nefarious manner that can undermine the confidence of not only the central bank, Mr. Vice President, but of the entire financial services sector in your country. And that will therefore weaken the standing of the banks in those foreign territories, whether it be Ghana or Guyana, in the case of Republic Bank, whether it be St. Lucia or Costa Rica in the case of First Citizens whether it be in the case of our insurance companies and their operations. Mr. Vice President, can you tell me much more at what time I should end? You have five more minutes. Thank you very much. So I want to ask, what has been the opinion of the Bankers Association, the written opinion, the public opinion, not if they're okay with the, with the change? What has been the publicly ex expressed opinion or the official opinion, if it's one that could not be expressed publicly, if it's at variance with the government's position regarding this amendment, what is the official opinion of the commercial banks operating in Trinidad and Tobago? What is the official opinion of the Bankers Association? What is the official opinion of the University of the West Indies? We teach banking and finance in, in, in Mona campus in Jamaica and at the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine as well in Cape and Barbados. What is the official opinion? And if the official opinion is at variance with this measure, then the government must explain in light of that. If it is not, well then, we wish them well. Similar change was made in the Financial Institutions Act. The arguments are similar, so I would not repeat them for that close. I will land my contribution on the Companies Act amendments. And I want to say that this is the perfect definition of an EJUC reaction. Because we only discovered this change in the midst of the pandemic. It is an unexplained decision albeit the government will try to, to explain the rationale for it, it does not assist companies. Many companies in this country are small, operate without any cerebral strength. They have strong sales, they have strong production, and that may be it. The ability and the time to keep approaching the Office of the Attorney General Legal Affairs to conduct what is basically paperwork is not available to many companies. Many companies are simply the owner and their relative. Would it have not been more prudent, Mr. Vice President, to limit the contact time that companies have with the Office of the Attorney General to once per annum? where it can be done. Because already the company has to communicate with the, the, the registry, the company's registry, every year to renew their annual returns, every single year. If now you add on that, 14 days after they have registered, so they, are, they have to return, so they have to go conduct a board meeting, mind you, return to the office of the, the register of companies, with an, so that's two contact points in their first year of operations. Then again, at the end of the first year, return with the annual returns. If during that first year, they change the, the beneficial ownership, the shareholding of the company, they must return again within 14 days. So if you have, let's say, X thousand companies on the company's register, and they change on average their shareholding once per year. That means, in addition to coming for annual returns, they must come one more time, so two times. So if it's X companies, it's two X times they must come to the office of the Attorney General. So if it's a thousand companies, it's two thousand times they have to come to the office of the company's register. 
This will simply put more burden on the public officers there to do the same task that could have been achieved at an annual return opportunity. I think this is a wasteful amendment. It is useless to the government in public service in achieving efficiency. It actually stymies the public service. It reduces the ease of doing business. What this government is doing by this mayor clause, Mr. Vice, Pre Mr. Vice President, is worsening Trinidad and Tobago's stand on the ranking of ease of doing business. They must remove it immediately. And in closing, I want to say that when one makes law, you must make law for all, not just the big companies that have the resources to do this. And the last point I want to make is there are many companies in this country that simply don't know their, their shareholding. I thank you, Mr. Vice President. Time is up. Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. May I, um, whilst here, for the record, ask that we put an extra table at the podium, please, because for people like me that don't read from a speech, um, we require multiple documents at the same time. And secondly, there is no clock at all within sight, so you are blind as to what time you actually have at the podium as well. So may I just make those small recommendations most respectfully, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, um, I thank honorable senators for their contributions, each and every one of them. And I took careful notes um, as to matters that require response. Um, I'd like to engage in that response with immediacy, if you would permit me. Um, essentially, there are only a few issues on the item deck. Number one, some senators asked what the purpose of the legislation was and whether there was a rational connection to the COVID pandemic, and therefore whether parliamentary time should be used um, discussing the miscellaneous provisions bill. Number two, um, there was an issue as to whether this bill requires any constitutional safeguard um, by the application of Section 13, the three-fifths majority um, requirement. Number three, there was considerable concern expressed amongst the opposition senators um, in relation to the income tax amendments, the secrecy provisions as they are relative across the Central Bank Financial Institutions Act and the Income Tax Act. Number four, um, there was some concern expressed in relation to the Companies Act as well. And Mr. Vice President, permit me um, to address any other matters in what I call a miscellaneous heading. First of all, Mr. Vice President, um, I actually do think that, quite surprisingly, the reduction in speaking time has helped us significantly as a parliament. Um, I find contributions to be extremely pointed and concise, and I wish to thank honorable members for their contributions. It is equally difficult to pilot legislation in an abbreviated uh, period of time because there is so much that is required to be put onto the record for the benefit of interpretation of laws if and when they are ever challenged. May I say, Mr. Vice President, there is a square and rational connection of this legislation um, to the COVID pandemic. After all, Mr. Vice President, surely one can appreciate that firstly in the extension of relief granted for the filing of companies' documents when you can't physically attend because of the COVID pandemic. That is obviously a requirement. Secondly, as Senator Dial Singh acknowledged in moving the amendments to the um, Mental Health Act to allow for the regional health authorities and the Ministry of Health 
to deal with patients in the pandemic period. That is obviously a rational connection. When you look to the relief that we're looking uh, for the Plant Protection Act, Senator Ramrat put an excellent contribution in easing the importation time that is taken in the COVID pandemic. When we look to the limitation of certain actions, the limitation period obviously providing an extension of the period of time is critically important because as Senator Sobers quite correctly noted, many attorneys have been turning up at the courts complaining that they want to file actions, come before the court to preserve limitation period. And obviously the closure and restriction of courts in the pandemic period is certainly connected. Equally so, the protection of magistrates is obviously connected to this because we're asking magistrates now to sit in virtual hearings and the, the risk of a magistrate being brought under the limited protection of the Magistrates Protection Act becomes even more real as we ask magistrates to exercise considerable functionality as judicial officers without full protection. Mr. Vice President, the secrecy provisions are squarely designed um, to assist the progress of matters via indictment, again saving preliminary inquiry time, and that is a material advantage. So contrary to the exhortations of some members of the opposition, not all, um, I can see that there is a clear and rational connection of this legislation as Madam President joins us to this particular um, exercise. Madam President and Mr. Vice President, as you both stand on the podium, permit me to also now dive into Senator Mark's positions as to the three-fifths majority. I want to thank Senator Mark um, sincerely for referring us to the judgment of um, R on the application of ingenious media holdings, PLC and another, uh, versus the commissioners of Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs Respondent. This is a matter coming from um, the uh, appeal courts in the United Kingdom. It went all the way up to the Supreme Court level and then finally it ended up before Lady Hale as Deputy President, Lord Mance, Lord Carr, Lord Reed, and Lord Toulson. And Lord Toulson, in fact, gave the majority government uh, decision. Delivered on the 19th of October, 2016. I want to caution Trinidad and Tobago to ignore everything that Senator Mark had to say about this because most regrettably, he did not read the relevant portions of the um, judgment and permit me now to correct the very dangerous statements put on the record by Senator Mark. First of all, Lord Toulson, in looking at this and for the benefit of Hansard, it's T-O-U-L-S-O-N, Lord Toulson specifically was considering the appeal on an issue where there was a newspaper report given by a financial entity. Somebody from the um, equivalent of the Inland Revenue, Her Majesty's Revenue in the United Kingdom, gave an off-the-record comment and revealed certain taxpayer information. That matter went to court when the person whose information was revealed brought judicial review proceedings. And the two lower courts allowed the information to be given because they said that it was rationally connected to judicial review principles. The superior court overruled the inferior courts and said you cannot simply look to JR for these bodies. You must look to the law of confidence. But in the written judgment, um, which is 14 pages, 13 pages long, Senator Mark skipped entirely over the most important provisions. And permit me to put it on the record. The United Kingdom legislation, the Commissioners for Revenue and Customs Act 2005, which is materially relevant to the clauses which we have here in looking at the Financial Institutions Act, the Income Tax Act, the Central Bank Act, when we're looking at the secrecy provisions, the UK legislation, which is section 18, says revenue and customs officials, and I'm reading from the judgment, may not disclose information which is held by the revenue and customs in connection with the function of the revenue and customs. But section one does not apply to a disclosure. A, they effectively set out civil proceedings, etc. But listen to this one, subparagraph D, which is made for the purpose of a criminal investigation 
all criminal proceedings, whether or not within the United Kingdom, relating to a matter in respect of which the revenue and customs have functions. It is therefore a serious disservice that Senator Mark has done by not specifically telling this parliament that the case was about a breach of confidence on general principles because the law cited in the very judgment has the same effect and provision as the law we're putting in now. In other words then, the statute has an express qualified exception that you can reveal information for criminal investigation or criminal proceedings. And therefore, I condemn the contribution coming from my friend Senator Mark as being out of hand wrong, quite simply. This is amplified, Madam President, by the fact that the judgment goes on specifically to say that the Marcel principle, this is at paragraph 18, and Senator Mark was holding his argument on the Marcel principle. Paragraph 18 says, the Marcel principle may be overridden by explicit statutory provisions, which is exactly what we are doing now. And worse yet, Madam President, it says at paragraph 31 of the judgment, as a matter of principle, disclosure of confidential information may sometimes be permissible on a restricted basis. But Madam President, the legislation specifically quotes Lord Brown Wilkinson, sorry, the judgment specifically quotes Lord Brown Wilkinson, which says, um, in, in reference to the In Ray Arrows Limited Number 4, 1995, two appeal cases 75, which puts out that the Marcel principle cannot operate so as to prevent the person obtaining information from disclosing it to persons to whom the statutory provisions either require or authorize him to make disclosure. So Madam Speaker, Madam President, Senator Mark gave us the exact wrong interpretation of the judgment and I thank him for referring us to it so that we could pull it up and read the true judgment for what it is worth. The true judgment is that the United Kingdom has an exact term in its section 18 exceptions allowing for the exception to secrecy Number two, that that exception to secrecy is specific for criminal investigations and for criminal proceedings. Number three, that the Marcel principle does not apply where statute expressly says otherwise. Now, Madam Speaker, Madam President, let me also put on to the record that we accept that the opposition has problems with disclosure principles as we did in the Income Tax Act previously. They have put their position on record. It's accepted. It has been rejected by the international community, the Financial Action Task Force, and the 190 countries that participate in that realm, and the Financial Action Task Force subbodies, the FSRBs. They all unanimously agree that the exception has to be provided for law enforcement. Now let me make this clear in answer to Senator Hussein, because Senator Hussein said something which I, I think the Honorable Senator simply got wrong. I don't think that he intended to mislead the Parliament, but Senator Hussein specifically said that the legislation that we are proposing, the Income Tax Amendment Acts, that we, the Income Tax Amendment Act that we are amending, he says that there is no due process. He said the court is absent. He said it simply is a situation where the TTPS can go and get information where required and um, the BIR has to give the information. I'd like to refer honorable senators through you, Madam President, to the provisions of the bill. Clause 14 of the bill specifically says, and I want to put it on the record, that the Income Tax Act is amended by this new section 4, capital A. It says, that the secrecy provision will not apply to information which at the time of the disclosure has been made available to the public from other sources. That is an actual acknowledgement of the law of confidence. The law of confidence specifically says that you lose the quality of confidence if it has been made public. 
And that is, in fact, underwritten by the judgment of Lord Toulson, the very judgment that Senator Mark referred us to, but read wrongly from. The Lord Toulson judgment specifically applies the common law principle of confidence <clears throat> set out in that famous intellectual property case of Fachenda Chicken versus Fowler, as I see Senator <clears throat> Vera here with us. The law of confidence applies. This is what we are putting into the exception to the Income Tax Act. Information in the form of a summary or collection of information so framed, etc. But here's where we go. C, the provision of a witness statement <clears throat> to a police officer above the rank of superintendent, etc. For criminal investigation or criminal proceedings, stick a pin exactly on all fours with the United Kingdom Section 18C1C provision. But here's this, where the witness statement one relates to information disclosed, past tense, under compulsion of law, this act or any other written law, and is required, is, is requested in writing by that office, by, by that police officer with the prior written consent of the DPP. So, Madam President, what we are referring to here is, in fact, the due process provisions recognized. Because this witness statement is for evidence in a court of law. It does not need to be sworn. It is simply to cause the admissibility of the evidence, other than by way of hearsay or by way of leading the witness at the point. It is to allow us to move to the power of the DPP indicting people under the preliminary inquiries 23 subsection 8 principle and I would like to say the request for this power came directly from the director of public prosecutions himself. It was underwritten by the opinion of his Queen's counsel Mr. Edward Jenkins and it is born on the back of the desire to allow the DPP to file indictments as he's permitted to do. Now, Madam President, permit me to put on the record the fact that the Financial Institutions Act um, is a very carefully drafted document. And the Financial Institutions Act at Section 55 is something that one has to have regard to. If we look to Section 55 one of the Financial Institutions Act, it specifically already allows for disclosure in the public interest. Section 55 1B says effectively that the secrecy provision does not apply where there is a duty to the public to disclose information. It is arguable in law that a requesting a witness statement from a financial institution to admit evidence already disclosed under compulsion of law. In other words then, the financial institution gave the information under production order under POCA, Proceeds of Crime Act, or they gave it under a search warrant under Section 5 of the Preliminary Inquiries legislation. They gave that. What the DPP is requesting is a witness statement to say, this is the information we gave, so that it can be formally admitted into the PI process of avoiding a PI where the DPP exercises his statutory principle to indict, not his constitutional principle under Section 90, but his statutory principle under Section 23.8 of the Preliminary Inquiries Legislation to go for a direct indictment for fraud and complex fraud and other matters, etc. That meets with his own constitutional ability to indict anybody under Section 90 of the Constitution, as we're well aware. This amendment to the law is being brought specifically to allow for an ease in the process of getting on with trials, Madam President. Madam President, may I ask what time full time ends? 49. 2.49. Madam President, thank you. So, Madam President, I, I most respectfully um, disagree with Senator Hussein's observations that we are looking at um, no court being involved. In fact, the court is there because the compulsion of law principle applies and the due process actually works in this particular instance, Madam President. Madam President, Senator Sobers asked for some clarification in relation to the company's legislation, the amendments that we propose. I respectfully 
do not accept the um, observations coming from my colleague, Senator Obika. Senator Obika's submission was that um, the ease of doing business was going to be affected by the company's uh, positions that we're putting into effect. Senator Obika said that there's no benefit to this. He said it was a knee-jerk um, reaction of the government. It doesn't assist us, et cetera. I think it's perhaps driven uh, because the law is not probably understood quite easily. I confess that companies' law is a little bit thick, and I mean no disrespect to my colleague, Senator Obika, but I think he just got it wrong. First of all, the amendment to the Companies Act is specifically proposed for discovery of shareholding. That is directly attributed to this fight against white collar crime, money laundering, financing of terrorism, fraud, etc. It is intended to fit in with the public procurement architecture. It is not acceptable that there is a risk that has been observed. And I'd like to address the knee-jerk reaction uh, principle that Senator Obika sought to ascribe to us. This is far from knee-jerk. This has come about because we have been diligently going through the company's records. We amended the Companies Act to include a new part which requires the disclosure of beneficial ownership. But in looking at the information on beneficial ownership that was coming to the registry, we observed that people were sidestepping the obligation for beneficial ownership because there was no legal ownership declared. In other words then, it is not a situation where somebody is saying, I am the, I'm, I am the beneficial owner because the real owner is really not the real owner. Let me explain that. A shareholding is declared in John Brown. John Brown is really a mask for Jane Doe. Jane Doe is the beneficial owner who is the real owner. John Brown is just simply the name that is on the paper. In this case, we have found as a result of the operationalization of the beneficial ownership law that because John Brown was never declared, Jane Brown wasn't required to be declared because there was no legal owner. And therefore, as a result of the diligent and meth meth and clear process that this government has put into effect in amending the law. We are fighting a loophole in the Companies Act and closing it once and for all. And Madam President, I understand that Senator Sobers was reflecting upon shareholding, etc. We are not looking at shareholding. We're looking at a company which is limited by guarantee, not a company which is limited by shares because you can have a company limited by shares in limited liability or a company limited by shares in unlimited liability. You can have a company limited, you can have a company structured by way of guarantee. Now a guarantee at law is effectively a promise to do something. And the consideration for it is that something else happened. So you can give a guarantee to a bank. I can guarantee a loan because you gave a loan to John Brown and therefore I guarantee the debt. The consideration is the fact that you gave a loan to John Brown. The guarantee construct in law for companies is that you establish the company and the guarantors identify themselves as saying, we, the several guarantors, undertake on winding up or liquidation or whatever there may be, that we will guarantee the liabilities of the company up to the statement of guarantee. In other words, then, $50, $100, $1,000. There is a lacuna in the Companies Act, and there has been for years, because nobody has been capturing the guarantee information. And therefore, that is another abuse of principle. And Madam President, quite simply put, nobody has been paying attention to the company's regime. But as a lawyer who has spent a lot of time in the company's regime, I am determined to close the loopholes. And this is designed to make a simple but extremely powerful dent in crime. It is tied in with our follow the money legislation, our explain your wealth legislation. All of it is designed to capture a better Trinidad and Tobago. So I hope that that lends some explanation to these points. I just simply do not agree that this bill requires any three-fifths majority. 
I would like to say to Senator Thompson, i.e., who's not here, I'm sure she's downstairs paying attention, perhaps on the, on the television, we gave an undertaking as a government to look at the issue of the age of uh, a child to commit a criminal offense. Yes, right now it is at seven years. We have been in discussion on this matter, and it is important for us to understand that the government can't make a decision by itself without consultation. We have this in actual contemplation. There is, in fact, a legislative proposal that is afoot, and I'd like to give Senator Thompson I.E. the assurance that not only have we been the government to do the most for children and for families, if you look at our legislative record, the Family and Children Division Act amended 23 laws. The miscellaneous provisions to deal with families amended 19 laws. We did all the regulations. We opened the courts, etc. This government has made its mark for children. And I would like to give her the assurance that this is definitely on the government's agenda as Senator Ayi comes back, that I'm making the point that we are looking at the age of, of, of criminality for children. It will come to us. Senator Ayi also said that we were looking at domestic violence as it affects children. I will remind Senator Ayi, um, or perhaps inform, that we have a domestic violence bill in circulation right now. We have met with stakeholders, including the Law Association, in Zoom meetings. That bill will be before us in Parliament in a matter of weeks, if not imminently, and therefore the issue of children and domestic violence is captured in that legislation. And I want to assure my dear and honorable Senator Thompson Ayi that I listen to everything that she says, and I never ignore what she says. It's just the process of getting it done. So those two issues are certainly being looked at, um, Madam General. President. Attorney General, you have five more minutes. Much obliged, ma'am. Thank you. Um, Madam President, I would like to say that the magisterial protection is definitely something that is deserving of attention. There is no way that we are removing the right of appeal on a magistrate's decision. That's just not on. We are amending the law, the Summary Courts Act. We are amending the law to put in the immunity for the magistrate in equal terms to a master who is also a creature of statute and a judge who is a creature of the Constitution. It is long overdue that, magistrates, ma that magisterial protection should be given. It is long overdue. We, out of an abundance of caution, coming from a recommendation from, Senate, from Mr. Ganga Singh, the Member of Parliament sitting in the opposition, that he asked us to put in the reflections uh, for the preservation of the right of judicial review and appeal, etc. I reminded uh, the Honorable Member of Parliament that, of course, inserting it into the Summary Courts Act, where the right of appeal exists anyway, because you have the Summary Court having the magistrate, having the, all decisions subject to the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, so the appeal was there. And I pointed out to Senator Singh, sorry, to, to, to the Honorable Member Ganga Singh, that we were not amending Section 14 of the Constitution. An act of Parliament cannot affect the Constitution unless it specifically is amending the Constitution. So the Section 14 of the Constitution remedy stands anyway. So for Honorable Senators to say, for Senator Mark to say that we are ousting any appeal on the, on the, on the magistracy is just wrong. It's constitutionally wrong to say that, Madam President, most respectfully. And therefore, we are not treating with any property rights. We are not removing people's access to the courts. And that whole fantasy of requiring a three-fifths majority just is not relevant to this debate, though I understand that it is a familiar touchstone for my learned colleague to go to. Madam President, um, the rationale for the Income Tax Act, the Central Bank Act, and other positions are, stand the same. Uh, for the financial institution structures. Um, I think in the round, therefore, um, we have certainly looked at most of the issues. Senator Sobers asked for us to reflect upon the broader animal protection rights, as, Sen as Senator Rambrat put onto the record. We are certainly doing that, and that is in the um, animal welfare amendments that we have before the parliament right now. 
Madam President, I think therefore I have addressed all of the issues that have been raised by my learned colleagues. I thank them each and every one for their, for their contributions, um, certainly on all benches. I, um, in those circumstances and with the pleasure of having um, advocated the recommendations to my learned colleagues, beg to move. Honorable Senators, the question is that a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Summary Courts Act, Chapter 420, the Oaths Act, Chapter 701, the Limitation of Certain Actions Act, Chapter 709, the Summary Offenses Act, Chapter 1102, the Dangerous Drugs Act, Chapter 1125, the Mental Health Act, Chapter 2802, the Children Act, Chapter 4601, the Shipping Act, Chapter 5010, the Plan Protection Act, Chapter 6356, Financial Intelligence Unit of Trinidad and Tobago Act, Chapter 7201, the Income Tax Act, Chapter 7501, the Central Bank Act, Chapter 7902, the Financial Institutions Act, Chapter 7909, and the Companies, the Companies Act, Chapter 8101, the Securities Act, Chapter 8302, the Caribbean Industrial Research Institute Act, Chapter 8552, and the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Amendment Act 2017, Act No. 9 of 2017, and to repeal the Magistrates Protection Act, Chapter 603, be read a second time. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. A bill entitled an act to amend the Summary Courts Act, Chapter 420, the Oaths Act, Chapter 701, the Limitation of Certain Actions Act, Chapter 709, the Summary Offenses Act, Chapter 1102, the Dangerous Drugs Act, Chapter 1125, the Mental Health Act, Chapter 2802, the Children Act, Chapter 4601, the Shipping Act, Chapter 5010, the Plant Protection Act, Chapter 6356. The Financial Intelligence Unit of Trinidad and Tobago Act, Chapter 7201. The Income Tax Act, Chapter 7501. The Central Bank Act, Chapter 787902. The Financial Institutions Act, Chapter 7909. The Companies Act, Chapter 8101. The Securities Act, Chapter 8302. The Caribbean Industrial Research Institute Act, Chapter 8552. The Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Amendment Act, 2017, Act No. 9 of 2017. And to repeal the Magistrates Protection Act, Chapter 603. Attorney General. Madam President, in accordance with Standing Order 66-1, I beg to move that a bill entitled the Miscellaneous Amendments Bill 2020 be committed to a committee of the whole Senate forthwith to be considered close by close. Honorable Senators, the question is that a bill entitled the Miscellaneous Amendment Bill 2020 be committed to a committee of the whole Senate forthwith to be considered close by close. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The Senate shall now go into committee of the whole to consider the bill clause by clause.
clauses one and two. This one's actually. Senator Mark, you have amendments. You've just signed off on them. Yeah, just sign off. All right. Um, do you know which clauses? Can you just tell us? Yeah, it's from three. So one, what is three, six, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, and twenty. Three, six, fourteen. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, and twenty. So, Attorney General, what I will do, because I don't want to delay the proceedings, we will begin. Um, I'll do clauses one and two, move to four and five. We'll deal with seven, eight, nine, and when we receive Senator Mark's um, amendment, we will go back to those clauses. Okay? Yes. Yeah. Much obliged. Yes. Clauses one and two. Honorable Senators, the question is, the clauses one and two stand part of the bill. I did, in fact, suggest to the, the, the clerk to get into one and two uh, under definition. What is meant by witness statement? Because witness statement seem to be very loose. S Senator Mark, but we're dealing with clauses one and two. That's way down in income taxes, yeah. the first reference. Yeah, we clause 14. Yes. That's clause 14. So what oh, I said oh, okay, is okay, we will okay, do, yeah? All right, okay, cool. So the question is that clauses one and two stand part of the bill. The question is that clauses one and two now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses one and two now stand part of the bill. Clauses four and five. The question is that clauses four and five stand part of the bill. The question is that clauses four and five now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses four and five now stand part of the bill. Clause seven. The question is that clause seven stand part of the bill. The question is that clause seven now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause seven now stands part of the bill. Clause nine. Eight, eight and nine. Eight? No, so eight and nine. Oh. Clauses eight and nine. The question is that clauses eight and nine stand part of the bill. Senator Vera. Thank you, Chair. Um, Honorable Attorney General, uh, I'm looking at clause nine. When you read the, the way the definition is going to be put into the act, it will read this way. Duly authorized medical officer means the medical officer in charge of a general hospital in which there is a psychiatric ward or any other medical officer. And then we insert employed by a regional health authority under the regional health authorities act or authorized by the minister to carry out duties such as are required to be performed by a psychiatric hospital director under the authority of this act. I'm wondering, because you're really talking about three categories, whether it might not be clearer to insert after, under the Regional Health Authorities Act, or any other medical officer authorized by the minister to carry out duties such as. I, I don't know if you follow the point, but... Yeah, yeah I, I actually um, did a markup as well for the parent law, right? 
So perhaps, Madam Speaker, if I, Madam Chair, duly authorized medical officer means the medical officer in charge of a general hospital in which there is a psychiatric ward. That's one or any other medical officer employed by the Regional Health Authority under the RHA Act or Two. authorized by the minister to carry out such duties as are required to be performed by a psychiatric. Um, I, I follow the Honorable Senator's point, but to me it reads clearly in the, in the version as marked up. Um, but I do understand the indentation reads a little bit easier. It's, it's a, certainly a contracting style. We'd write contracts like that and positions. But from a drafting perspective, I know that this is the way the CPC's office drafts the definitions. But to me, in the marked up version that I have, it reads clearly. Yeah. It's, it's just as you said, it, it's truncated. You, you talk about one, two, or authorized by the minister. But yeah. really, we are talking about any other medical officer authorized by the minister. It's not a point I'm making a big fuss about, but yeah. I just thought for clarification sake. I, I catch the point, but I, th I think it's caught here respectfully. So You're only okay with that. So, right? Honorable Senators, the question is that clauses 8 and 9 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 8 and 9 now stand part of the bill. Clause 3. The question is that Clause 3 stand part of the bill. Our members in receipt of the proposed amendments, the list of amendments from Senator Mark. Can I see by a show of hands who has not gotten the amendments as yet? They're being circulated as we speak. While they're being circulated, we'll move on. Clause 10. The question is that Clause 10 stand part of the bill. The question is that Clause 10 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 10 now stands part of the bill. Clause 11. Clause 11. The to yeah. Clauses 11 to 13. The question is that clauses 11 to 13 stand part of the bill. Senator Vera. Um, Honorable Attorney General, I'm looking at clause 11. And I'm looking at the parent act. So the shipping act is amended, A, by renumbering section 406 as section 406 one and then inserting out the 461 so in the parent act it'll read 405 406 one is that it because it's all i'm just trying to ascertain what happens to yes, the original so, 406. so what's going on is we are doing a 406 one and two. Whereas there was only a 406 before, it now becomes 406, one. open brackets one, and then we put two. So it's going to read that, it's just the way that the draftsman includes the reference to a subsection two. He had to put a subsection one in. So it is not going to be like a 406 capital A or 406 one that is an anomaly. So there won't be a 406 and a 406 one. It's a 406 sub bracket one and then sub bracket two. I thought so. I just wanted to put sure, it on the record. Sure, of course. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure. Sure. At, um, Attorney General, there is in fact on the Parliament table as we speak a shipping bill. Yeah. And with the amendment that is being proposed, are we proposing the amendments as it relates to the current shipping act or are you anticipating that with the new shipping act coming into effect this amendment would be more relevant to the new shipping act 
or whether we stay in, or whether we are staying in the status quo. Uh, I just found it a bit cumbersome. Sure, Madam Chair. The Shipping Act is over 600 clauses long. And if we were to wait to pass that with a three-fifths majority, it's actually taken about 20 years for them to do the work. No joke. Because the, the international conventions have changed so many times that they had to go back to the drawing board. So whilst we're ready to deal with that act, I fear that parliamentary space won't give us the opportunity okay. to do that. So in the meanwhile, one of the big issues outside there is the unregulated party boats. Mm -hmm. And this amendment is intended to allow us to put the fines to a proper level to regulate that aspect because we've got the regulations prepared. Thank you, Chair. Just um, allay Senator Mark's concern because how I read section 11, clause 11, B, is that what the interpretation act will allow that where a written regulation or law is breached, then punishment can be imposed under the interpretation act. But the interpretation act is woefully low. So in effect, this amendment will allow for offenders who breach the shipping regulations to be fined up to $150,000 or imprisoned for a term of up to 10 years. Now, Senator Mark, the shipping regulations touch not just registration of ships and tonnage and things like that, but they touch about passenger safety, ship and port security, load lines, medical examinations at the time of COVID. So the, the, the regulations really need to be beefed up, and I think that's what this is aimed at. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Vera is so correct. And in fact, we've drafted the new regs already. We have them waiting. But when I looked at the new regs, I said, but hold on. They have no teeth because the offense is just too low. So we, th we thought, because we want to do those regs immediately, let's sidestep the, the big shipping act and, and bring it in here. So, honorable senators, the question is that clauses 11 to 13 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 11 to 13 now stand part of the bill. Clause 19. The question is that clause 19 stand part of the bill. Senator Dana Ryan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Attorney General, I don't know if the point was raised during the debate, but I have one point for clarification on clause 19. Senator Dana Ryan, can you speak the more into the mic, please, and just oh, pretend you're shouting at me okay. and, and so you can raise your voice. Okay. Yeah. Attorney General, um, the previous conception of the board in the Parent Act had some sort of regional representation on the board. Now, the Kariri is a regional institution that is responsible for local and regional development, driving innovation and technology in Trinidad and Tobago and the region. So my question to you, with the removal of the UNDP from the composition of the board, where in this amendment is there room to allow for any sort of regional representation on the Kariri board? And Senator Vera? Yes, thank you, Chair, because I also want to echo Senator Dunerine's concern. Um, when I look at the Parent Act, the funds of the Institute come from the United Nations Development Program Special Fund. And the original board comprised United Nations Development Program regional representative that Port of Spain is nominee, as well as persons nominated by such other governments in the Caribbean region as support the institute. Those have dropped off. And I'm wondering whether that was deliberate or inadvertent. Attorney General. Thank, I thank the honorable senators. So number one, the Ministry of Planning, who is the recipient of these funds, um, the UNDP funds, etc. The Ministry of Planning is who fashioned this particular amendment after consultation with the entities themselves. So it's driven by the policy that comes from the Ministry of Planning. Secondly, the regional representation in a more relevant sense comes from the University of the West Indies because you can't get more regional than the University of the West Indies and that is definitely underwritten by contributions from all of the governments on that end. So UNDP comes from the policy of the Ministry of Planning after consultation with the entities 
We're told that it is not as relevant as it was then. And number two, in answer to Senator Dionarine, the University of the West Indies catches the, the regional basket. So, Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 19 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 19 now stands part of the bill. Clause 3. The question is that Clause 3 stand part of the bill. Senator Mark, you have yes. proposed an amendment. Madam President, out of an abundance of caution, even though the Attorney General has indicated that these matters are already um, are assured in terms of judicial review, etc., I would like to suggest for his consideration, out of an abundance of caution, that we amend Section 3, Clause 3 rather, to reflect that that is the real intention, and at least minds would be more settled as to the way forward. Because I don't want to leave this thing up to interpretation of the court. I feel that we have a duty to insert such an amendment so that everyone would be comfortable that we are not closing the doors as it relates to taking action against magistrates who act outside of their jurisdiction. Attorney General. My friend can be comforted by subsection 2, which has exactly the same concept in it. So clause 3 of the bill has two sections. We have, we have 159.1, no action shall be brought, etc. And then subsection 2, nothing in subsection 1 shall in any way impair the availability of other forms of relief in respect of decisions of summary courts jurisdiction, ju summary jurisdiction, including appeals, applications for JR, and applications for redress under Section 14 of the Constitution. And, and this was taken from the Magistrates Protection Act itself, which we last amended and put that into. So we had already fashioned that formula in the Magistrates Protection Act when we last amended it. Senator Vera. And just to point out that under Section 9 of the Magistrates Protection Act, um, it had already provided that no action could be brought against the magistrate for the exercise of any discretionary power. So something along those provisions are already in existence. This just makes it a lot clearer. All it means is that you, 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 you still have a right of action against the state, but you just don't have a personal right of action against the, the, the officer, which, which is, is fair. Which is the way it should be. And, and I should add, Madam President, that, Madam Chair, the, the State Liability and Proceedings Act does not allow an agent of the state to be a judge per se or a magistrate, etc. So this is in keeping with all the other laws that we have on, on our books. Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 3 be amended as circulated on behalf of Senator Mark. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the no's have it. Honorable Senators, the question is that clause three now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause three now stands part of the bill. Clause 6. The question is that Clause 6 stands part of the bill. Yeah. Yes? Under the emergency regulations, um, as, was, as were in fact developed under the public health ordinance, I could have seen during the period of, we are still in the period, COVID 2019 where the Attorney General brought amendments and he gave himself certain elasticity or space to make changes, which is quite reasonable within the framework of the pandemic. But it's another matter to put into legislation for, 
forever until it is amended in the future. A power of lawmaking to the Attorney General, Madam President. I believe that the Parliament is the body that makes laws and we should not be given that power or providing any space for any Attorney General to extend the law without parliamentary approval. Senator Vera. I, I very much appreciate Senator Mark's concern, but perhaps if I were to give an example. Um, a lot of times people wait until the very last minute to file their claims. Sometimes the day before the expiry date. Persons who are in that situation, who could not get an access to a lawyer, who could not file because the Chief Justice had passed the practice direction that no matters could be filed, they would suddenly find themselves time barred. Right? There are people who, who, so what this section is really doing is giving a time out that will allow citizens who would ordinarily been able to file in normal time or normal situations, but who have been preempted because of the emergency regulations, not being able to see lawyers, not being able to file documents. I think that is what this is curing. So I think it is entirely reasonable and proportionate. Make a last intervention. If, an, if a general election is called in the month of August and members of the elected house did not make their five years, they would not be entitled to pensions. Madam President, there is no provision in the Pensions Act to allow the, the Minister of Finance to make those changes. My view is simply this. I, I believe it's a very dangerous precedent that we are setting to give the Attorney General a, this kind of power without supervision. There is no supervision of this power. And therefore, I believe that we should delete that provision that gives the Attorney General lawmaking power. Attorney General. I'm somewhat surprised to hear Senator Mark say it's dangerous precedent. Senator Mark, I'm sure, is well aware that, number one, the Interpretation Act clearly sets out the fact that we have subsidiary roots of making law. They come by statutory instruments, they come by orders, they come by regulations. Some of them never see the light of Parliament, and that's in the case of orders. That bolted and is not precedent since the Crown Colony days of Trinidad and Tobago. The laws of Trinidad and Tobago, when we moved from Spanish law to English law, put that into effect. Secondly, this is a benefit, not a detriment. If we were creating a detriment, I could understand the argument being persuasive to say, look, if you're going to create a detriment for somebody, you ought to have a, an actual act of parliament to treat with that. This is a benefit to people, and therefore the proportionality is more than improved. In any event, right here in this bill, we have evidence of that precedent having been set for the Companies Act. Because in the Companies Act, we can extend the operation of time frames by way of order via the Attorney General, who's also the Minister of Legal Affairs in this instance, simply giving an order to extend the time, non-profit organizations act, companies act, income tax legislation. So I can't really accept Senator Mark's position that we're making bad law or dangerous precedent because that would be to be ignorant of all of the very many things that I've just put onto the record where there is ample precedent and this is a benefit. So I respectfully do not um, accept the recommendations coming from my learned colleague. Senator Vera. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to put on the record that this is a modification of an already existing law, the Limitation of Actions Act, and no one, I agree with the Attorney General, no one is suffering any detriment by the application of this law. It does not take away or impair any vested rights. It does not carry or impose any new duties or obligations. It serves the public good. So, Honorable Senators, the question is that clause Six, be amended as circulated on behalf of Senator Mark. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. 
I think the no's have it. Honorable Senator, the question therefore is that clause six now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause six now stands part of the bill. Clause 14. The question is that clause 14 stand part of the bill. Senator Mark. One bit by the arguments proffered by the Attorney General and using the example I used as it relates to the United Kingdom, which has an expressed provision in their legislation. We don't have it in ours. And this leaves room for arbitrariness on the part of the government and, and by extension, given the police um, a certain kind of authority that if they have to have those that, um, that kind of power, it must be regulated with the requisite constitutional majority. And therefore, I am not, I'm not moved by the arguments made by the Attorney General that I misled anybody. I do not support that. And I'm saying that if he continues to proceed along the line that he, the Honorable Attorney General, intends to pursue, then he will meet others in court. Senator but I do Vera. not support it. Thank you, Chair. Um, under the Income Tax Act, there is an official secrecy provision at Section 4. And basically, it says, every person having any official duty or employed in the administration of that act shall regard and deal with all documents, information, returns, assessment, lists, and copies um, in a certain way. And if you were to breach the provisions of the, that official secrecy provision, um, you're guilty of an offense. Now, what we have today, FIU, all kinds of money laundering offenses, um, that secrecy provision is at odds with these new obligations and requirements put on our other office holders. So when you troll through the amendments, I don't see anything in these amendments that offend the Constitution. A, information which was already available from other sources, it's already in the public domain, there's no harm. Information in the form of a summary or collection of information so framed, basically you're giving a pre you're not naming or identifying the person, there's no harm. The provision of a witness statement, it's a necessary step if you're going to be bringing prosecutions. Without that, we're, 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 we're engaging in prosecutorial conduct with one hand tied behind our backs. Um, so I, I don't see anything in here with respect that um, infringes the privacy rights of any citizen or goes against the constitutional safeguards. Senator Hussein. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, just to add my concern with respect to clause 14 of the bill. Okay, Senator Hussein. Yes. I invite you to shout at me <laughs> so that I can hear you. I don't know if they say thank you, Madam President. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm looking at for a, a Attorney General with respect to the disclosure of taxpayers' information in the public from other sources. Um, in the event that the information was disclosed illegitimately, um, what is the position there? Because I can't understand what you're getting at with respect to this particular clause, because let's say, for example, some information is released on a political platform, for example. Um, those are concerns that we have to, um, to also contemplate. Secondly, with respect to B, who will be the applicant asking for this information um, because you're asking for a summary of the information without disclosing the identity of the taxpayer. So who is the applicant for that information in clause sub B, sorry? Attorney General. Thank you. First of all, may I thank Senator Vera for his intervention. Um, I want, there's one thing that Senator Mark said that was correct. Um, he acknowledged that the United Kingdom has this in their law. And I'm good with that. That's a complete acknowledgement of the reverse of what he said in his debate. So I thank the Honorable Senator for giving that admission. 
Um, therefore, we have precedent in the UK experience in Section 18 of their particular law in particular. And Madam President, if I may now turn to Senator Hussein's um, questions. So with respect to the applicant, the most immediate of applicants under 4AB, um, summary or collection of information is the CSO. Um, and in fact, this is for statistical information. There are research capacities being done. The only way we're gonna advance the revenue management of Trinidad and Tobago is for there to be proper analysis. In this case here, the desiccated information, which is devoid of personal um, information, such that you cannot, under any circumstances, manage the identity, lifting it out of it, is what is, is required. Far too often, many of the entities have complained that they just don't have the ability to get required statistical information to allow for the development of our analysis of tax structures, compliance, and other mechanisms. The point is, nothing will ever erode the strict operation of the confidentiality provisions. And if we look to the same case that Senator Mark referred us to, that is the Ingenious Media Holdings PLC case um, delivered on the 19th of October 2016. The underscoring coming from Lord Toulson, uh, with whom Lady Hale agreed, um, was very powerful that public bodies are also obliged to obey the common law standard of confidentiality. And I thought that that was a very interesting observation for their lords to make in that particular judgment. So answer to B, the applicant is whomever may require statistical or desiccated information devoid of provisions. Safeguard that applies is that the law of confidence must strictly apply in addition to the general parameters of section 4.1 of the Income Tax Act, which is a strict obligation of secrecy. With respect to paragraph A, subclause A, 4 capital A, A, information which at the time of disclosure is or has already been made available to the public from other sources. Once there is a breach of confidence and confidentiality has been lost, you now no longer have the common law standard applying, even in the statutory context. And that was made clear in the very judgment that Senator Mark re referred us to. And that has been the law for time immemorial, quite frankly. And the law of confidence is well known in this country. The thing inside of here is that nothing will ever necessarily remove the general overriding principle of secrecy. So they can easily be challenged to any disclosure that happens. <clears throat> but the, the, the political mischief that can happen and the platforms, I mean, I, I, I recognize that there have been many instances. I mean, this country observed an attorney general holding a confidential criminal file from the Anti-Crime anti -crime Investigation Bureau um, under the last government, standing on a platform, reading out the contents of the file in breach of the law. And you know, that was obviously something that could have been treated with by way of a charge or otherwise, but this is well underwritten by the common law and the statute, the rules of interpretation, the general strictures that confidentiality and secrecy are the paramount concern, as Section 4.1 of the Income Tax Act specifically contemplates and puts into effect. So, Honorable Senators. I want to respectfully disagree with my colleague, <coughs> Independent Senator Anthony Vera. And I just want to tell the Attorney General that the United Kingdom has a written and unwritten constitution. We have a written constitution with entrenched rights. And Madam President, I rest my case. I am not convinced by him. Neither am I convinced by the argument of my, my friend in the back, respectfully. Madam Chair, one rejoinder, please, which is important for the record. The United Kingdom, prior to Brexit, was a member of the European community. And Article 14 of the European Convention has, if not more powerfully so, the confidentiality provisions and the constitutional undermarkings that the English government and people have been constrained to obey. And I refer to the case of MARPA, MARPA versus the UK, 
was brought about in circumstances of a challenge to the DNA legislation. And in the MARPA UK case, 25 judges, I'm not joking, 25 judges of the European Court upheld the constitutional quote-unquote right for an English citizen under the EU Convention. What we're referring to here is the statute. Statutory interpretation is what guides us. The question as to whether a three-fifths majority is required is, has been made clear by Baroness Hale in the Surat case, in Barry Francis, in a number of other cases, Northern Construction. Not every Section 4 or 5 right requires a Section 13 exception where it is known to the law that due process is the balance to the consideration. So for, for the record, the submission in law has been made clear by our courts and the Privy Council. So, Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 14 be amended as circulated by Senator Mark. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the no's have it. Honourable Senators, the question therefore is that Clause 14 now stand part of the bill. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 14 now stands part of the bill. Clause 15. The question is that Clause 15 stand part of the bill. Senator Mark, yes. I do not want to detain you too long. My arguments hold for both 15 and 16. I don't want to repeat them, so you can take both together, if you wish. And my response, respectfully, to my friend, friend is the same as that for Clause 14, and I seek to rely on those submissions. So, Honourable Senators, the question is that Clause 15 be amended as circulated by Senator Mark. Those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. No. I think the no's have it. So the question, therefore, is that Clause 14 now stand part of the 15, bill. 15. 15, sorry, now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 15 now stands part of the bill. Clause 16. The question is that Clause 16 stand part of the bill. The question is that Clause 16 be amended as circulated by Senator Mark. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the no's have it. The question therefore is that clause 16, 16 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 16 now stands part of the bill. Clause, clause 17. The question is that clause 17 stand part of the bill. Senator Mark. My earlier submission that I do not believe that the Attorney General of this country should be given lawmaking power, even though it is going to be the benefit to the benefit of certain persons in the society who, as Senator Vieira said, might run afoul of the arrangement and coming out late. I am saying you want to make changes, come to the parliament and we will give you the requisite support. Don't stay in your office and make an order. I reject that. Senator Vera. Thank you. The, the, the constitutional provision at section four is the following fundamental human rights and freedoms, namely C the right of the individual to respect for his private and family life. Very careful language, respect for private and family life. So the state can't go interfering with people's private business into their private affairs and personal matters at home. They would be infringing their constitutional protection. But when an individual files with the Board of Inland Revenue certain documents and information and disclosures, is the state interfering with this private and family life when it shares that information with courts of law or with other authorities on a need to know basis? Or when that information is already out there by some other means, is there a breach of confidence? I, I, I mean, I very much respect Senator Mark and I know he's a watchdog and champion for 
individual um, fundamental human rights. But on this occasion, I think we need to look at the wording of the Constitution and see if it really meets the moment as per the amendment. I, I, personally, I'm satisfied that the amendment does not infringe. My submission, Madam President, in terms of amending um, Clause 17 has nothing to do with Sections 4 and 5 rights. This is lawmaking we are talking about, and I'm simply saying only the Parliament has the power to make laws, not an Attorney General. And I'm saying it has nothing to do with rights under Sections 4 and 5, as my friend respectfully has alluded. Attorney General. Thank you, Madam President. Well, Madam Chair, what Senator Mark just said is wrong. The law and our Constitution clearly identifies, yes, that Parliament makes laws for the peace, order, and good governance of Trinidad and Tobago, Section 53 of the Constitution. However, the law is pellucidly clear that there are different methods to make law. And in fact, orders are a method of making law, and that has been the situation since 1962. And even, even you know, I stayed quiet. <laughs> Madam, Madam That's President. That's you. Atu um, Senator Mark, please. So don't tell me I don't know what you're talking just about. Just finish. Senator Mark, you have made your contribution. I'm sorry, Attorney Madam General. President. I apologize to you. Attorney General, continue. Thank you, Madam President. The Constitution is clear that the Parliament makes laws for the peace, order, and good governance of the citizens of this country. That is so set out in Section 53 of the Constitution. There are methods to make law which the Parliament has created. One of the methods of making law include the utilization of subsidiary route, which is called an order. You can have a statutory instrument, you can have regulations, you can have other forms. Orders have been a feature of the landscape of our laws since we were a crown colony. It then became entrenched in our 1962 and 1976 positions as we moved ahead through independence and then to Republican status. It is not correct. In fact, it is wrong to say that the Attorney General can't sit in his office and make a law. If the law provides you to do that, you can. And I'd like to note in relation to this particular Clause 17, which we're looking at, Clause 17, that boat sailed long time. We amended the law as a Senate. In fact, Senator Mark himself said yes to the amendments to Section 516 of the Companies Act, where we included the amendment for the order by way of extension of date. Senator Mark himself also voted for the same formula in the Nonprofit Organizations Act. So for Senator Mark to today come and reverse his position is unfortunate, Madam President, and I therefore I, I reject think, the position. Yes, Senator Mark, one final point, please. I reject the AG's position, and I also want to say, can I, through you, Madam President, make a further amendment to my amendment <laughs> and, and indicate the amendment I would like to propose by order subject to an affirmative resolution of the parliament. I want this to be subject to an affirmative resolution of the parliament. So if you are making an order, it must be subject to an affirmative resolution of the parliament, and not whimsically or arbitrarily by any individual. We must see it. We are in charge. Uh, Senator Mark, Sorry, ma'am. Could you please give me Sir, the wording? Yes. Yes, Ma Madam Chair. To your amendment. Yes, by order, the further amendment, um, delete yes. prescribed, Madam President. Yes. And just put after order, subject to an affirmative resolution of the both houses no, no, of, no. Of, of Parliament. Of Parliament. Yes, Madam President. So I think I, su I think the AG supports me now. So, honourable senators, the question is that Clause 17 be amended as circulated by Senator Mark and further amended as follows. 
in subclause B and C delete the words or such other period as the minister may by order delete the Senator Mark? This, this is well, no, all I'm asking, Madam President. This is not making any. Or order. such other period as the minister may by order subject, right, to an affirmative resolution of Parliament. Yeah. Full stop. No, but you've asked for that to be deleted. If you read A in your proposed amendment, in the proposed new. Sub so you, you can't have it both ways. You're asking for those words to be deleted in both. No, well, I was saying that given all the argument that the AG had put forward, I was trying to see if I could have accommodated it. No, but if I can't, it, it may well, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll stick to what I have. Sure, here. thank you. So, Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 17 be amended as circulated by Senator Mark. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. No. I think the no's have it. Honorable Senators, the question therefore is that Clause 17 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 17 now stands part of the bill. Clause 18. The question is that Clause 18 stand part of the bill. Senator Mark. And I saw this word in Clause 18 and I couldn't understand what. Yes, Madam President, if you go to close 18, you will see where the word, where this goes, you see, to the Commission, any amounts obtained as a result of non compliance. I just find that to be a bit unsatisfactory. And I don't know if the Attorney General may wish to consider deleting that word. And, 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 and maybe putting something in its place that can control the commission rather than using the expression as we have used it, any amongst and so on. I, I just find that would, it looks like it's arbitrary, Madam President. So, Attorney General, I'd like you to consider this, the removal of the word any in the context of what is being proposed in this particular um, paragraph. Well, Senator Mark, you've asked for more than that from the proposed amendment, or am I missing something? No, well, 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 that's another amendment, ma'am. That's the first amendment, and the second amendment deals with the um, H. Senator Mark, I'm really calling on you to treat with the amendment that you have circulated. So let's deal with this first. You've proposed an amendment. So I'm asking you to address us on the proposed amendment. Yeah, well, well, I've addressed you on any already. That's the first amendment. Right. And the, and the second amendment deals with five million. Yeah. Yeah, there are three. There are three, the Senator Mark. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. The second amendment is the any. And then the third amendment is the third amendment. Okay. Subclause A, let me go back to subclause A of 18, madam. Yes, oh, yeah, Madam President, yes. Yes, you're correct. 18, same approach, but there was an addition to clause 18, and I'm proposing that we delete A, consistent with my earlier arguments. That is the point. So I'm grateful for your guidance on this one. So consistent with my earlier argument, 14, 15, and 16, Madam President, I am saying if you look at 18, you will see the same provision there. Delete. The second argument, I am asking the Attorney General to consider, Madam President, Madam Chair, the word any seems to give the commission an arbitrariness. And I, I like the Attorney General to consider a better language in this context. And finally, I don't understand where 5 million came from. From 500,000 to 5 million. I find it very con um, arbitrary. So I am suggesting a million dollars instead of 5 million 
maybe we can debate that and discuss it. But clearly, I think I find the, in, the increase in the fine is very uh, uh, um, exorbitant for a commission to impose on its own. So that is why I'm asking the Attorney General, even though I put one million, it is subject to discussion. Madam President. Madam President, thank you for guiding me on A in particular. Senator Vera. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, for the, the debates, but I think I did hear something to the effect that the effect of one of these amendments is that if the commission makes administrative orders, there can be no appeal to a court of law. The, the, sorry, it's the other way around. It's the other way around. Sections 160 onward, 159 onward, preserve the absolute right of appeal. Everything that the commission does is subject to appeal. Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm heartened to hear that, because I know from first-hand experience where people who ordinarily are not operating in securities, but because they issue like a bond, um, find themselves under the Security Commission's mantle. Yeah. And the Securities Commission has all kinds of requirements about filing notice of change of director, change of office, filing audited accounts. And there has been, in one particular case, I'm not going to call the name, where this authority is fined every year repeatedly because they fail to file audited accounts with the commission. Mm -hmm. The problem is the parent act of that authority provides the audited accounts must be prepared by the auditor general. And year after year, the auditor general is not ready to provide to audit accounts, and so they are in breach through mm -hmm. no fault of their own. And yet, year in, year in, year out, they are fined repeatedly. I understand that this happens with other authorities. That must not, the, the, the right to appeal must not be taken away. So I just want to make sure that this, is, that this amendment does not affect that. Attorney General. Madam Chair, I wish to assure my friend, Senator Vera, that section 160 under division six um, is entitled Appeals. It's under the Securities Act, Chapter 8302. Specifically, the Commission may on its own a motion or an application have appeal. Um, that's the Appeals for Review, where the Commission can do it of its own volition. And then there are Appeals to the High Court in 161. Any person directly affected by an adverse decision, finding, or order of the Commission may appeal to the High Court etc. So the right to appeal for the individual, the person affected by decision of that tribunal, if I could use it that way, is specifically preserved in section 161 and then it goes even further in the rest of division 6 of the Securities Act. Madam President, if I may, Madam Chair, if I may um, deal with Senator Marks, three amendments um, therefore, because that's what the question is right now, with respect to paragraph A, which is the secrecy modification. I adopt the arguments already laid in respect of clauses 14, 15, and 16, and I respectfully disagree with the Honorable Senator. In respect of the word any, it is necessary so as to preserve the discretion factor as to the extent of disgorging, and therefore it may be as much as the whole, or it may be just as little as part, and therefore it is intended to carve the discretionary factors out. In respect of the issue of five million versus one million, this has arisen as a result of case law coming from the um, commission itself, where um, in a particular instance, the public had a significant outcry that the fines that were levied in a particular matter were too low, and the commission had to make a public statement to indicate that they were constrained by the law having the, the fines as low as they were. I'm surprised that Senator Mark is not aware of this. Um, Senator Mark, when he sat in a different position, in fact, protected the Minister of Finance, Larry Hawaii, um, by saying a matter was before the court when it was not. But um, in fact, Madam President, this is born as a result of, uh, sorry, that a matter was sub judice when it was not. A pre-action letter is not a notice from the court. So Madam President, this comes from the public domain, the experience, Laws are adjusted from time to time for the general benefit. This is not intended to be ad hominem. Let me make this clear. This is not law being passed for the benefit of any particular case. I want to make that abundantly clear, <coughs> lest we fall into the trap of the Leonage case, 
that look as classical as it relates to ad hominem legislation, which could never stand. This is law for the general purport and benefit. The improvement in the quantum of fines is specifically born out of the experience of the SEC, and the SEC has recommended that we move upward, and the cabinet has recommended that we go as high as five million. The SEC's original position was certainly up to a million. The five million is the cabinet's recommendation in recognition of the fact that the maximum is not the full extent you're going, you're going to be exposed to. The law is quite clear from a statutory point of view that when you give a description of a penalty of five million, it may be anywhere between zero and five million. And therefore, it is not intended to be a prescriptive sum that is, must be applied in every circumstance. It is the range um, establishment as the upper ceiling of what the regulatory limit is in terms of a breach of it. So, Madam President, for those reasons, I most respectfully um, disagree with the submissions recommended by my learned colleague, Senator Mark, and I thank you for the opportunity. I hope, Madam President, that this $5 million did not arise out of the inability of the securities industries via the Security and Exchange Commission to do its job properly along with other agencies of state that may have led to what the Attorney General um, talked about, the fine was too small when they could have taken other stronger action. So, so Madam President... Let's hope, let's hope that's not the basis. Just one second. But I stand by my position that this is a, a huge amount of money, I have no problem, but the AG said that it can, that's the maximum, and it can go at other levels, but that is the maximum. That is his view, but. Minister of Public Utilities, am I seeing your hand up? To s okay, Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, the, the danger with the last word is that you must reply, so I apologize for the obligation to reply. Let me make this abundantly clear. Number one, it is not intended to treat with any one case. It is of general purport. I want to make that absolutely clear. Secondly, um, in respect of a particular matter, which Senator Mark is clearly referring to, and I have no problems with him referring to it, the point is there was no failing by anybody to act. The point is whether you have the ability to act. One of the methods of acting is by way of administrative fines, it is specifically set out at sections 156 and 156A of the securities law, and 156A is with respect to the scheduled fines that you have for breaches of, uh, of offenses, going by way of administrative penalties instead, and 156, which is what we're amending, is with respect to the general aspects not scheduled in section 156A. And therefore, I just would like to say that as far as I'm aware, there is no complaint in relation to the SEC itself as to any material shortcoming on its part. Honorable Senators, Senators, the question is that Clause 18 be amended as circulated on behalf of Senator Mark. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. No. I think the no's have it. Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 18 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 18 now stands part of the bill. Clause 20. The question is that Clause 20 stand part of the bill. As a legislator, I am committed like the UNC, the incumbent government, we are committed to ensuring, Madam President, that the Parliament is involved at all stages of this exercise. Not after something becomes law, and then you table it, and then we have to file a motion to annul it, and it goes into effect while the debate is taking place. Only if it is null, then it is thrown out. Madam President, we are submitting that we make primary law here in this parliament. And if we are delegating through delegated authority, we must have the power to ensure 
that whatever is being done, it must be debated in the parliament before it can become effective and become lawful. And hence the reason, Madam President, we are advancing that there should be an affirmative resolution to any matter that is being addressed and it must be brought to the parliament before it becomes law. Not after it becomes law, you then table it and I can then debate it to determine if it will be annulled or not. So I am proposing affirmative. Thank you. As I see these amendments, what we're really talking about is a change in procedural system as opposed to substantive law. The 2017 law introduced the merit point system and reformed fixed penalty provisions. Um, and again, I come back to the point, this looks to me to be a matter more that serves the public good and the public interest because these change in the procedural provisions is really for the general benefit of the public. My question is, just for the record, um, so if someone was issued a fixed penalty notice last week, could they avail themselves of this law? Because it, the date, the starting date is um, I, well, it, I think it's six months. There is a six months from the date this law takes effect. So you have a window. Um, so it, 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 this is not just retrospective in, in application, but it will also deal with fixed penalty notices that may be issued next week and next month as well. Would it not be, Honorable Attorney General? Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Chair. There's no retrospectivity, right? This is intended to treat prospectively with the position. We actually have on deck right now a formula that we're going to bring to the Parliament and another miscellaneous provisions bill to treat with the existing situation. You see, the complications in the magistracy right now are one, you have a district. So you have to go to the district where the thing happened. You may not be from the district. Number two, that there is no method of deeming them per se to be something else. Because remember the demerit points, what we did in creating a new section 20 A, B and C of the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act is that we created the concept of a, a violation springing from a conditionality of road user. So you had a license to drive a car or to be on the road or to engage in motor vehicle and road traffic. And therefore we took the criminal into more of a civil approach. It's a pseudo-civil approach. What we have to do now, which we've actually done a first draft of already, is we have to now take the old creature, the offenses, which is a criminal offense, and now morph those into a different creature. And we've drafted a law, actually, I trouble CPC at all hours of the night, and he tolerates me. Um, so the CPC's team is, is constantly at work. So we've drafted the provisions to treat with the backlog. This one is intended to treat with fixed penalties as, they, as, as, as we will transition them into this. So I confess that we're doing this in stages. This won't become operational until we proclaim that law and then we convert that aspect and then we're gonna treat the backlog as we bring those two elements in. Because one of the things that we have to do if we want justice to be delivered in this country, is just remove the sheer volume of matters that ought not to be in a court, or rather could be in a different forum of management. So it's an ease to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Certainly it's a benefit. Secondly, in response to Senator Mark, that the parliament should be involved. The parliament is involved. We are recommending the process of negative resolution in the negative resolution prospect. Yes, it does become law until it is negatived by way of a motion. The, my own experience with affirmative resolution is that it sounds good, but we've never actually not done an affirmative resolution in this parliament for two reasons. One, when it comes, you have the majority, unless you're in a deadlock in the Senate. And two, the fact is, if you were going to amend an order coming by uh, affirmative resolution is very complicated because 
there's one school of thought that says you've got to come back with a totally different affirmative view. So it is a very time-consuming process to be engaged in, if not complicated. But where you're, pro where you're prescribing a benefit for the citizens, you're easing them to, in this case, say 50% of what they were liable to is a massive benefit to the people of Trinidad and Tobago because there must be a quid pro quo, a this for that. And the this for that is come and pay your tickets, declog the system, and take the benefit right now of a 50% reduction of what you were otherwise exposed to and also avoid the risk that you have of finding yourself brought before the court by way of summons or warrant. Senator Vera. AG, I agree with you. I think this is a gift to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I also agree with you that retrospectivity does not apply. Um, but just for the record, because the average citizen is not going to be able to decipher the language of the, uh, the amendment, what we are saying is, prior to the repeal of the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Enforcement Act, that is the starting point. Yeah. If you have been served with a fixed penalty notice between starting from that date until there's a court hearing and a conviction, any time within that period and going into the next six months, if you have a fixed penalty notice, you're only going to be paying half. Yes, that's it. And we'll be doing a heavy education campaign along with this so that people are adequately informed. The Chief Justice will be doing practice directions so that we could manage the case log because what we intend to do is to shunt the payments into electronic payments so that people don't even have to come to court per se and that they can pay it in different ways. Senator Hussein. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, Attorney General, I just want to get some dates um, clear. Um, has the former act been repealed as yet? No. No. And secondly, what is the intention of the um, government with respect to the commencement date of this particular act? So, Madam Chair, I thank the Honorable Senator. It's squarely rooted to the clause before us for consideration. The Cabinet has deferred its consideration of the operationalization of this law whilst the COVID pandemic was up. So, the note is before Cabinet right now. The Cabinet will have to make its decision on the um, putting into effect the proclamation of the law. We are all ready for it now. The Ministry of Works and Transport, Senator Rohan Senanan did a phenomenal job, one, if I can be immodest, one of the best I've seen in terms of publicity and campaign and position. The operationalization of that law is going to be a huge benefit to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. I personally am anxious to see the law proclaimed, but that's a matter for the cabinet and it would therefore be premature of me to give a precise date for that. Suffice it to say, the note is before the cabinet as we speak. Because, uh, if I may, Madam Chair, because what I'm seeing is that there are two effects of this clause, which is one, a reduction in the fine by 50%, and also a pardon, so to speak, because now you're no longer liable. Now, if you pay a ticket, you will be admitting the guilt of the offense, that you committed the offense. But in this case, once you pay the 50%, you are also being given a pardon also, am I clear? Well, well, the existing law is that you purge yourself of the criminality upon payment. That's, that's the law as it is already with respect to fixed penalty notices. If you don't pay a fixed penalty notice, it goes into a different zone. You're going to trial? Yeah. Senator Mark, final yes. comment? Yes, madam. May I ask the Honorable Attorney General whether this 50% reduction is there a time frame for it, or is it going to be a permanent arrangement? Because I was going to ask my dear friend, the Senator Anthony Vieira, it might be a gift. It might be an election gift. <laughs> so I just wanted to ask my friend if this is going to be for a perpetual period, or is it going to be only for a specific Period. Can you help us with that, Honorable Attorney General? Sure. May I, Madam Chair? Yes. Ma Madam Chair, obviously the reason why we have the ability to vary it is to encourage people to come now before it gets more expensive. So the intention is squarely for people that are not paying to raise the percentage. So you may get uh, you know, less discount if you want to see, right? And with respect to the other submission, I just want to remind, we have made tremendous amendments to the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act for years now. 
this was in the making for years. I think that it's true, the gift to the people of Trinidad and Tobago is the renovation of the law. I mean, it's no small feat. I could understand the panic caused in the opposition to watch a government be able to reduce the caseload in the magistrate's court from 146,000 cases to 8,500. That must surely panic a government um, yes, a, a, a government, an opposition. A government to that come, must surely a government panic an opposition. You're right, you're right. Let me finish so, my point, please. The UNC is the next government. I'm about to end, Madam Chair. Uh, please allow the Attorney General to finish, and then I'm going to put the question. Right. Yes, Madam Chair, I was saying I could understand the consternation and panic in the opposition at watching a government able to take the backlog and the current caseload in the magistracy from 146,000 cases per annum each year down to 8,500 and to have computerized the entire magistracy to have made all the amendments to the criminal justice system because when you watch a government capable of doing that, knowing that you had your turn at the wheel and just did absolutely nothing with it, it must cause panic. So I understand my colleague well. So, honor, so honorable senators, honorable senators, Senator Hussein, may I have your attention, please? Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 20 be amended as circulated by Senator Mark. Those in favor say aye. Yes, aye, yes. Those against say no. no. I think the no's have it. Honorable Senators, the question is that Clause 20 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 20 now stands part of the bill. Honorable Senators, the question is that the bill be now reported to the Senate. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The bill will now be reported to the Senate. Attorney General. Madam President, I wish to report that a bill entitled the Miscellaneous Amendments Bill 2020 was considered in Committee of the Whole and approved without amendments. I now beg to move that the Senate agree with the Committee's report. Honorable Senators, the question is that this Senate agree with the Committee's report on a bill entitled the Miscellaneous Amendments Bill 2020. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Attorney General. Madam President, I beg to move that a bill entitled an act to amend the Summary Courts Act, Chapter 420, the Oaths Act, Chapter 701, the Limitation of Certain Actions Act, Chapter 709, the Summary Offenses Act, Chapter 1102, the Dangerous Drugs Act, Chapter 1125, the Mental Health Act, Chapter 2802, the Children's Act, Chapter 4601, the Shipping Act, Chapter 5010, the Plant Protection Act, Chapter 6356, the Financial Intelligence Unit of Trinidad and Tobago Act, Chapter 7201, the Income Tax Act, Chapter 7501, the Central Bank Act, Chapter 7902, the Financial Institutions Act, Chapter 7909, the Companies Act, Chapter 8101, the Securities Act, Chapter 8302, the Caribbean Industrial Research Institutes Act, Chapter 8552, and the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Amendment Act 2017, Act Number 9 of 2017, and to repeal the Magistrates Protection Act, Chapter 603, be read a third time and passed. Honorable Senators, the question is that a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Summary Courts Act, Chapter 420, the Oaths Act, Chapter 701, the Limitation of Certain Actions Act, Chapter 709, the Summary Offenses Act, Chapter 1102, the Dangerous Drugs Act, Chapter 1125, the Mental Health Act, Chapter 2802, the Children Act, Chapter 4601, the Shipping Act, Chapter 5010, the Plant Protection Act, Chapter 6356, the Financial Intelligence Unit of Trinidad and Tobago Act, Chapter 7201, 
the Income Tax Act, Chapter 7501, the Central Bank Act, Chapter 7902, the Financial Institutions Act, Chapter 7909, the Companies Act, Chapter 8101, the Securities Act, Chapter 8302, the Caribbean Industrial Research Institute Act, Chapter 8552, and the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Amendment Act 2017, Act No. 9 of 2017, and to repeal the Magistrates Protection Act, Chapter 603, be now read a third time and passed. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. A bill entitled, An Act to Amend the Summary Courts Act, Chapter 420, the Oaths Act, Chapter 701, the Limitation of Certain Actions Act, Chapter 709, the Summary Offenses Act, Chapter 1102, the Dangerous Drugs Act, Chapter 1125, the Mental Health Act, Chapter 2802, the Children Act, Chapter 4601, the Shipping Act, Chapter 5010, the Plant Protection Act, Chapter 6356, the Financial Intelligence Unit of Trinidad and Tobago Act, Chapter 7201, the Income Tax Act, Chapter 7501, the Central Bank Act, Chapter 7902, the Financial Institutions Act, Chapter 7909, the Companies Act, Chapter 8101, the Securities Act, Chapter 8302, the Caribbean Industrial Research Institute Act, Chapter 8552, and the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Amendment Act 2017, Act No. 9 of 2017, and to repeal the Magistrates Protection Act, Chapter 603. Acting Leader of Government Business. I beg to move that this House, the Senate, do now adjourn to Tuesday, May 12, 2020, at 10 a.m. Madam President, on that date, the Government proposes to deal with the Bill for an Act to amend the Registrar General Act, Chapter 1903, among other pieces of legislation, and also to deal with a Bill to amend the Copyright Act, Chapter 8280. I thank you. Honorable Senators, before I put the question on the adjournment, leave has been granted for two matters to be raised. Senator Mark. Thank you very much, Madam President. Madam President, the first matter that I would like to bring to the Senate's attention through this motion deals with the failure of the government to provide the country with adequate information on the reasons for its decision to terminate the services of almost 66 zero contractors employing approximately 1,800, and it might be more like 2,400 employees in the National Re forestation and watershed rehabilitation program. Now, Madam President, it was some time earlier this year, I believe, that the government took a decision through the Minister of Agriculture to discontinue the services of 60 to 65 contractors whose organizations were involved in a number of important activities within the forested areas of our country. Madam President, this led to the termination 
as I said, of some 2,400, between 1,800 and 2,400 workers. These workers, we are told, were in receipt of at least $1,100, I believe, on a, on, a, on a fortnightly basis or monthly basis. But they were in receipt of a, um, a wage or a salary um, during the period that they worked, Madam President. Now, the termination of these contracts, as well as these workers, came at a time when the dry season was upon us and is upon us, Madam President, um, when this event occurred, Madam President. Madam President, we would like to have from the Honorable Minister of Agriculture as to what were the factors or reasons for the discontinuation of these 65 contractors, each were employing, from my information, between 30 to 35 individuals, and that is where the 2,400 workers came about. Now, these workers and their contractors and employers were responsible for managing forest fires and, of course, with the not only managing forest fires, but they were also engaged in the planting of trees as well as the watering of same. Now, with their termination, Madam President, even the Trinidad and Tobago Fire Service expressed some concern. I recall reading a story in which the president of the Fire Officers Association stated that the loss of jobs by these workers as a result of the termination of these contracts would put a heavy blow on the fire service, which is already overwhelmed by a number of events that they had to deal with, Madam President. And therefore, it is important to understand, because I do not believe the Minister of Agriculture offered a sufficient basis for this termination of these contracts and the placing of workers on the breadline. We would also like to know from the Honorable Minister what has happened since the termination of these contractors and the termination of services of the workers involved. What has happened? Has the minister embarked upon a program where new contractors have been engaged? Have the workers who have been terminated been reconsidered or are being considered for reemployment? These are questions that these workers and their families would like to know. Because, Madam President, to place hundreds of workers, in this instance, as I said, between 1,800 and 2,400 on the breadline is a very, very difficult time for workers. So I would like to ask, as I said, Madam President, the Honorable Minister to provide this Parliament with the rationale 
the reasons, the factors that led to the discontinuation. I understand that these contracts would have been issued to these contractors some time ago um, by the government, and therefore to bring those contracts to a sudden end um, in the way it was done is cause for a lot of concern. So, Madam President, my understanding, just to correct the record again, is that these workers were paid at the time they were employed roughly $1,100 um, per fortnight. And as I said, the purpose of these groups, along with these organizations, NGOs, becoming contractors, was to help preserve the forests and to ensure they assist in clamping down on forest fires, which as you know, during the dry season, are very rampant as we are aware. So Madam President, the NGOs that were involved in this exercise were community-based. The workers who were employed by these contractors were mainly single mothers and a number of young people, youths. And they were, these were youths who otherwise might have been on the streets of our nation. And therefore, it is important for us to understand why this decision was taken and what has happened subsequent to this decision by the government of this country. Because workers have been placed on the breadline and we don't know, Madam President, I am not informed and I dare say the country has not been informed as to the alternative that has been put in place, what system has been um, um, effected, how that system was effected, and by whom, Madam President, in terms of agency, whether it was advertised, Madam President, whether it went off a tender or tendering, these are matters that we'd like the Honorable Minister to share with us. And industries. Very much. Thank you very much, Madam President. Madam President, the reforestation program known as the NRWRP started about 17 years ago. It was supposed to be a short-term program recognizing, Madam President, that we have what are known as forest reserves in significant parts of the country. But we also have, in between those forest reserves, we do have some state land that could be brought under forest cultivation and eventually included in the forest reserve. And we also have commercial forestry areas, which over time have been, the, the, it's commercial, so the trees have been harvested and can be replanted for future generations. So in 2003, the government of the day went about this program, anticipating that it would last a particular period of time. Madam President, over a period, over the period, it just went on and on. And when my colleague on the other side, Senator Mark, when his administration was in power between 2010 and 2015, they themselves conducted an audit of the program, which found that by and large, even after 11 years at the time, the program had not met its objective. In fact, the line minister at the time was in the media around October 2014, facing a lot of pressure because of a decision to stop the program. 
to conduct a review to see what the future of the program should be like if there was going to be a future. That was former Senator Ganga Singh. And I could well imagine that he got himself under so much pressure that the review and all of that was quickly abandoned and the program resumed some months after. So stopping the program is not something new, but that is not what we've done. I'm just given the context of it. I just want to be very clear, Madam President, in responding to Senator Mark by saying the workers in this program do not fight forest fires. Very early in my term as minister, on Good Friday 2016, I had the most unpleasant task of having to visit an officer of the Forestry Division at the Port of Spain General Hospital, Keith Campbell, in responding to a fire on Chancellor Hill, wearing the best fire retardant equipment, Keith suffered severe burns and died on Good Friday night at the Port of Spain General Hospital. And I immediately made it clear to all and sundry in the ministry, particularly Forestry Division, that the job of responding to forest fires is not a job of our officers, but the Trinidad and Tobago Fire Service. From time to time, if you are in the forest or in an agricultural area, you may see the start of a fire. You may see small bush and people who are familiar may do something called beating down the fire, taking tools that are available to beat down a very small fire. But only the trained should deal with forest fires. And as Minister, I've consistently made it known that our officers and in this reforestation program, nobody should be fighting fires. And Keith Campbell, who eventually was bestowed with a posthumous national award the following year 2017. His life serves as an example that forest fires are not easy to tread with. Madam President, what has happened here? After being appointed minister, not long after, within months, I conducted a technical or, or commissioned a technical audit of this program to see if it was meeting the objectives of replanting forests replanting commercial forests, and also bringing state land in between and around forest reserves into the quality of forests that could be added to forest reserves. The audit report didn't, was not very optimistic. It pointed to serious problems, not due to the workers in the program, but due to the supervision or absence of supervision by our forestry division. A follow-up audit was done by the Minister of Finance through the Central Audit Committee, and that follow-up audit pointed to a number of financial and other irregularities in the program. The most important thing that audit pointed out was that while this program was under the Ministry of Agriculture, this became a $98 million program over a period of time. This started off as a very small program, and over the years, transformed itself into a program that was almost $100 million. But it was not tendered for by the ministry via the Central Tenders Board. And the audit report pointed out that the ministry itself could not have the financial authority to execute this program via contracts on its own. And a decision was taken by the cabinet that the procurement of contractors for this program will be done by the Rural Development Company of Trinidad and Tobago, a, a special purpose com company quite suited to execute a procurement exercise like this. And thereafter, the Rural Development Company advertised on many occasions, and the contractors in this program, the 60 contractors, each employing 35 workers, were constantly advised that there will come a time when, through this process, contractors will be selected. And some of them may continue and some may not. In fact, Madam President, I should point out, in the history of this program from 2003 to now, 
not a contract by way of a single letter, a one-page letter or anything has ever been issued to a contractor. So I estimate about half a billion dollars has been spent without a shred of paper resembling a contract and I set about to, to deal with it. Madam President, after a lot of effort, several advertisements, numerous efforts to clean up and bring this program in the way it should be in accordance with the rules, particular, pro particularly procurement, we got ourselves in a position where the Rural Development Company was in a position through the procurement process to recommend the award to certain contractors. We thereafter, thereafter, notice was given to all the contractors, the 60 contractors, and the notices set out the context of the letter, reminding them that they had been told that this day will come when we would shift to contractors procured through a transparent exercise, and the notice gave them until March 31st, 2020 to perform this work. Thereafter, there will be a switchover to contractors procured under the program, some of whom might be the existing contractors. Unfortunately, Madam President, the stay-at-home intervened. During that period when we would have shifted from March 31st to April, and it became impractical for this program to continue from the 1st of April, because, Madam President, these workers are transported in minivans for 10, 15 miles to go into the forested area. A lot of the contractors have 11 seater vehicles that will transport these workers. Uh, they, they have lunch and camps in the forest, so on, so on. And, and it, it, it was not possible, it was not practical, sensible to allow the program to continue in the month of April and into the month of May once we had the COVID period. These workers are entitled to claim the salary grant and they can do that. They have, what we've done, we have transitioned and I can tell you the Rural Development Company to whom the entire project has now been transferred by cabinet decision will be engaging the new contractors, some of whom will be existing contractors, into this program and a public announcement would be made consistent with the COVID regulations on the resumption of this program for these workers. I thank you very much. Senator Mark. Thank you, Madam President. Yes, Madam President, the second matter, matter I'd like to address is the need for the government to ensure that students who reside in rural communities are provided with internet connectivity as well as the required devices to access the ministry's student platform during the period of COVID-19 pandemic. Now, Madam President, since the lockdown, shutdown, stay-at-home orders, all our students, whether they are the primary school level, the secondary school level, or even at the university levels, have had no choice because of the pandemic, but to stay at home. Madam President, during that period, and we are told by the Minister of Education that schools may be reopened in September. So from the period March to the present time, into September, possibly. Students, pupils at the primary school levels have been unable to be adequately served. And we understand why. But 
the government did indicate to us that they had established what is called an e-learning platform and that students could access this particular platform. We have not had any further reports of substance from the ministry as it relates to what has been happening with this interactive, this kind of learning rather, through technology. There has been no reports on how our students are engaging via the internet. What we do know, Madam President, and we need some information, is that according to the minister in the Ministry of Education, over 60,000 students in this country are attending school at the secondary level are without internet, without devices, without laptops. So the question that has to be asked, and we need to get answers this evening, Madam President, is how are these children at the primary level, at the secondary level, how are they being given the opportunity to access learning through the e-learning platform and maybe other mechanisms. And particularly, Madam President, those students who are in the rural communities or in the rural areas of our country where you know connectivity is very difficult at times. So, we have children at the primary school level who are preparing and their parents are helping them to prepare for SEA. We don't know when SEA is going to be held. We are here in June, we are here in July. It could be beyond because of the pandemic, but hopefully, when the Prime Minister addresses the nation on the 10th of this month, he would in fact announce the gradual and incremental reopening of our economy and our society, and therefore the role of education and what kind of changes that will have to be brought to bear on that process is going to be very fundamental. So, Madam President, we have the children who are preparing for SEA. We have the children or the students who are preparing for CXC. And we have the, the, the students who are preparing for CAPE in terms of advanced levels. But I have raised this matter today, Madam President, in the interest of the tens of thousands of students and pupils at the various levels of the educational apparatus. Because we have not been hearing much from the ministry on this matter. What we do know is that the ministry keeps saying that the matter is before cabinet. And I believe it went from cabinet to um, FLGP. But as it relates to how the Ministry of Education is addressing this matter of learning as children at different levels prepare for various examinations. We have limited information. So Madam President, I've brought this matter to this Honorable Senate today to get some answers. How are we allowing our students who are without laptops, over 60,000 
of them to access the e-learning platform? Is the government making efforts to provide these devices to the children? What efforts have they made? Or, Madam President, are we to conclude that for the last seven and a half weeks, going into eight weeks, Madam President, children have not been exposed to the kind of, to some element of training, some element of education, because we don't have information. So we have to speculate what is taking place. No one has come before this honorable parliament, the Senate, to indicate what is taking place to our children. How are they learning? What kind of interaction is there? What, what kind of efforts are being made? Is the government, Madam President, seeking to provide thousands of um, laptops to our children so that they can access the e-learning platform? We don't know. So we need answers, Madam President, from the Minister of Education. In fact, Madam President, I saw, I, I read in today's <coughs> Express on page 13, an educator, Tyrone Ali, writing a very comprehensive article, head, the headline being, the Ministry of Education sleeping during COVID-19. That's a question that this author of this article, Tyrone Ali, is asking whether the ministry has fallen on the job is this ministry fast asleep? Are we, Madam President, like Rip Van Winkle? Are we sleeping? What is going on? So we need answers, Madam President. And I'm asking the Minister of Education or whoever is responsible for dealing with this matter to provide the Senate with answers on this question of learning and our children who are suffering in the meantime. Thank you very much, Madam President. Minister of Labour and Small Enterprise Development. Thank you, Madam President. I rise to respond to Senator Wade's mark motion on behalf of my cabinet colleague, the Minister of Education, Minister Anthony Garcia. Madam President, the Ministry of Education Madam President, just bear with me. Yes, good. I start over. Thank you, Madam President. The Ministry of Education is cognizant of the needs of the students residing within our rural communities who may be experiencing difficulties in accessing learning materials. In this regard, the ministry has facilitated access to teaching and learning material to all students through partnership with various stakeholders. Currently, the ministry has secured free access for all teachers, parents, and students, particularly in rural areas, who log in into the school learning management system, also known as SLMS. As a result, many more students are now able to access online learning. Furthermore, the ministry is able to make internet hotspots available in areas where there is limited or no internet access, thus expanding the accessibility of online teaching and learning to students. Madam President, the ministry's school learning management system has provided a platform for all teachers to provide content and continue delivering content to their students. There are many benefits to the SLMS because it allows for one, developmentally appropriate learning experiences, materials and resources are available for parents to work with students at the ECC level. A calendar was also included to assist parents in organizing the day for students. Two, all curriculum documents and the instructional toolkit for the primary level were uploaded for use by teachers 
for planning content and for parents to track students' progress to national goals. The instructional toolkit has more than 600 lesson plans with suggested activities and materials that can be used to create learning experiences. Three, past papers for the SEA and the National Certificate of Secondary Education, NCSE, are available to assist students in preparing for examinations. Madam President, in 2019, the format of the SEA changed, so the mathematics, English language, English language arts, and English language arts writing papers with this new format are available for students to continue preparations. The 2017, 2018, and 2019 NCSE multiple choice papers for the eight subject areas assessed are available in a self-correcting quiz format so students receive their scores after completing a paper. Madam President, past papers and examination support materials for Caribbean Secondary Education Certificate, also known as CSEC, and Caribbean Advanced Proficiency Examination, CAPE, are available through links provided by Caribbean Examination Council. Students can use these materials to revise and prepare for examinations. Madam President, links from international organizations which provide access to a range of audiobooks, games, and other materials are available for use by teachers and parents in keeping students engaged in learning experiences. Madam President, teachers within the service continue to utilize innovative online strategies to ensure that students are engaged in learning while home. The WhatsApp application is widely used by teachers in communication with students and parents for teaching and learning. Madam President, the ministry has also utilized traditional television broadcasts to provide learning experiences available to our rural students. For example, sessions geared towards standard five students preparing for secondary entrance assessment, SEA, have been filmed on site at the Ministry of Education's head office and are being aired on TTT. These lessons are in the three subject areas of focus for the assessment. Mathematics, English language arts, and English language arts writing. The content available through these media fac facilitates learning as well as examination preparation. A variety of media were used to ensure that all students have some level of access to materials to continue learning remotely. Madam President, the Ministry of Education has been collecting data on the number of teachers and students who require electronic devices to facilitate teaching and learning. In the meantime, the Ministry has taken steps to acquire electronic devices for distribution to teachers and students in need. The Ministry has also sought the assistance of local organizations and foreign agencies to supplement the cash of electronic devices. These devices will be distributed as soon as they become available, starting with the students most in need. Madam President, the Ministry of Education continues to work assiduously to provide quality education to all students even during a pandemic. On behalf of the Minister of Education, I thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> Honorable Senators, the question is that this Senate will now adjourn to Tuesday the 12th of May, 2020, at 10 a.m. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. This Senate now stands adjourned to Tuesday the 12th of May, 2020, at 10 a.m.